Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Such a great crowd. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We have such a great program for you guys. Uh, my name is Christine Ray Carter. I'm the uh, executive director of the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art. And we have this special program highlighting Kim Kirchman's retrospective exhibition celebrating her retirement as a professor of St. Petersburg College after 30 years. So uh, we're excited to learn more about Kim's process and her experiences and her, um, her wonderful career as an educator. Uh, before we begin, I do wanna let you know that, um, please know this program is being recorded. So I hope you're okay with that. Um, we will make this recording available on the museum's YouTube channel uh, in the next week or so once it's been edited. So keep that in mind. Um, Tonight, with this special program, as I mentioned, we are celebrating the career of artist and educator Kim Kirchman as part of her retirement exhibition, Kim Kirchman, an Allegory of Spring. Kim is in conversation this evening with Lerma's curator, Sarah Felice, who organized three vibrant exhibitions for the 2024 spring season here at the Lieber Ratner Museum of Art, including, including the beauty of excess, the pattern and decoration movement, which highlights the major artists of the P&D movement, such as Robert Kushner, and many who have informed Kim Kirchman's floral pattern ceramic works. This program will take place over about 40 minutes and uh, in conversation style as Kim's work is uh, scrolling past behind us. And this will be followed by a Q&A with the audience. So we will pass the microphone around uh, so that you can join in on that conversation. A little bit about Kim. Kim Kirchman is a renowned ceramic artist and has taught at St. Petersburg College since 1993 as an associate professor for arts and the lead instructor for ceramics, sculpture, and three-dimensional design curriculum. As a fourth generation native Floridian, the natural beauty of our state and the dense lush environment influences the form and surface of her work. Kim earned a BFA and MFA in ceramics at the University of South Florida. Starting out as a painter, she evolved into a sculptor who discovered clay as a medium. Her interest in functional forms developed from the structure of domestic life, such as sharing meals that make deep connections with family and friends, which serves as the conceptual inspiration for her hand-built ceramic works. In this talk, we will discover Kim's unique slip transfer technique, hear about her experiences in Japan, and hopefully get a sneak peek into her studio, Hidden Lake Pottery, located in the beautiful countryside of Odessa, Florida. Sharing this experience with us this evening are many of Kim's respected colleagues, mentors, and students here in the audience. Kim's desire to explore the world, both inner and outer, through careful precision and ornamentation, her work both in and outside the classroom has left an indelible mark on the Tampa Bay region and beyond, as she consistently reinforces the profound impact of her environment on her creative identity. While this exhibition serves as a culmination to celebrate her career at St. Petersburg College, it is important to recognize that life like spring itself, she embarks on a revolution and a rebirth into her next chapter. Much like the wildflowers that have influenced her throughout her life, she blossoms into the allegory of her next season. The Lieber Ratner Museum of Art is honored to present the life and work of Kim Kirchman, a rebel against convention and a master of ornament. So without further ado, please welcome Sarah Bacon. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> You make me sound a lot better than I, <laughs> I feel like yeah, I don't know. Uh, thank you, Christine, and thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. Um, so Kim and I, when we started this process of kind of getting to know each other for the first time, uh, she was, you know, warm and gracious and, and invited me over to her studio. And I don't know, I, we have friends and colleagues in this audience. So many of you have probably been to her studio and I will just say it is a dream 
in and of itself. Um, I could just live there. Can I move in? <laughs> I love my studio. Yeah, I mean, I do. <laughs> we all love your studio. Um, so when we sat down initially to have a conversation, um, or on the record conversation, if you will, uh, when we were developing exhibition texts, we talked a lot about kind of your origin story and um, this process of you coming of age and who you were as a kid. Um, so this is kind of a bit of a multi-part question to start off. Okay. Uh, so can you share more about your early creative influences, especially your attraction to drawing and collecting found objects? Because I know that's something you talked about. Yeah, I think um, part of this starts with um, maybe the fact that I moved around a lot as a child. So um, I don't think there was one year in my elementary school years that I was at the same school, um, which makes um, you a little bit... Um, at least for me as a, a kid going into those environments, I was always very watchful and sort of very observant. Um, the other thing about it was um, I didn't carry toys with me because we moved so much. So I ended up spending a lot of time just making toys or basically going out into the woods and picking things up and making constructions. Um, I also drew a lot. And I think because I got a lot of positive affirmations uh, when I would go into new situations that it actually just sort of encouraged me to keep working. Um, also, my father was uh, a model airplane builder. And uh, one of the things that he always had um, at the house was his own studio, so to speak, to build his airplanes. And I think that kind of reinforced my idea of um, making as a really important aspect of just living. Um, it was always a priority in the family. And so it sort of became a priority for me as well. Um, but because I spent so much time by myself and I spent so much time in the woods, I, I just basically think both of those things reinforced each other. This idea of, I'm going to riff off the, the page here a little bit, um, this idea of hand building um, and, and creating, it's interesting because you didn't actually start out as an artist. No, I started... At, Okay, well, yeah. I mean, I think with a lot of people that go to college, their parents have certain aspirational desires for them. And of course, my parents wanted me to go to college and become something like a business major. In fact, that's what they really wanted me to be, which was a horrible nightmare for somebody like me. I was not, um, I mean, I was going to college initially in the 1970s. I mean, you can tell by the way I dress now that I, I was kind of a hippie kid. So um, I did not fit into the business school very well. In fact, I was always sort of signaled out as a person not to be in the business school when they talked about dress for success and all this other stuff. Um, but I kept making things and I kept taking classes. And um, it essentially derailed my initial college experience because I didn't want to be in that space. So I just essentially quit and did some other stuff. Um, I found my way back to school as an art major because I had always been drawing the whole time. And that was always a big part of what I thought as my own self-identity. In fact, I don't really remember not drawing actually. And, um, and so I, ended up in St. Petersburg and I thought I needed to do something with my life. And I took a class at SPC when it was St. Petersburg Junior College with Jim Hagenbuckle. And, um, you know, he looked at me one day and he said, I don't know what you're doing, but you're, you're an artist, you need to go to school. So I ended up um, going over to USF and finishing up my undergraduate degree there. So, I mean, it was a pretty circular sort of half. Um, in a lot of ways, I think it was good for me as a teacher because I sort of recognized in my students um, that most art students don't go in a linear way. They go in a really circular way. So, you know, I could relate to what they were doing. I, I mean, yeah, I, I think you have that effect on them too, because recently, um, I don't know if I told you this, I went to a women's group and the president of that women's group was one of your students. And I mentioned that we were having your show and she just lit up and was like, Kim Kirchman, Kim Kirchman. So um, you leave an impression, you know? Well, I, 
I think really as a working artist and a teacher, I mean, uh, sometimes you can look at teaching as uh, something that gets in the way of making. Um, but for me, it's been really a great experience because it's actually informed my work quite a bit. And so um, we are a foundations um, college program for arts. And I think the fact that I've been immersed in foundational training for art students has made me look at the formal aspects of my work quite a bit. And um, I utilize a lot of that when I'm studying up my compositions. So something that I found particularly interesting about you, just because when I'm thinking in my, my own art world um, outside of the museum, I am not a left brain person. I am all on the right. You have a particular interest in mathematics. Um, how do mathematical concepts or principles find expression in your artwork? And can you provide some specific examples of that? So this is not that unusual for art students to actually like math. They exist. Um, so, so I'm the strange one is what you're trying to say. No, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I like people that actually do enjoy math. And uh, when I was an undergraduate student, um, I used to take math classes as my electives, which seems a little bit bizarre. Um, I really liked calculus quite a bit. Um, what I liked about it the most was when I started learning about problems that um, they're called limit problems, which is a pretty fundamental calculus problem. Um, essentially what they were, you would have these um, equations that you would map on a graph and um, there were certain values that were indeterminate. In other words, they didn't really exist. And uh, what was interesting to me about that was um, I always thought about this idea of um, boundaries as being definitive, you know, like one thing ends and another thing starts. So it seemed like fixed. But what I realized through math was, and through limit problems was that was actually not true. So you could get really close to a value and, and you could get really far away from a value. And so this idea of um, infinitely going away from something was, really logical, but the other thing was infinitely small going towards something, but never really arriving at a certain point. And um, that idea, which is probably this really weird layman's way of sort of understanding that, but this idea ends up being a concept that has interested me my, my whole life. And it's a recurring theme of my work, basically, um, whether it's stated or unstated, I guess. So, yeah, math is good. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for the inspiration. Yeah, I know. I don't know. <laughs> um, so this is kind of tied into that a little bit. Uh, your work, a, a lot of it, especially what we have on view in the gallery now, involves the use of tiles, uh, bringing attention to the borders of the object on display. How does this awareness of borders contribute to the overall narrative uh, or aesthetic of your pieces? So if I go back to sort of that idea of the indeterminate um, space, um, which to me in my mind sort of sound, stands as a liminal space. So it's a space that is a space of becoming, it's not present or future, but it's uh, somewhere in between. Um, that became really important to me to like focus on those areas. Um, I think um, there's a lot of energy and, and so most of my surface work or my approach to surface or organizing the surface actually relies on the grid. Sometimes the grid is really apparent, like, uh, of course, obviously in the tile pieces. Uh, sometimes on some of the vessel forms, it's not quite as apparent, but when I set up my decoration, it's always there. And I think about the grid in a lot of different ways. I mean, not only does it talk about uh, getting close to the boundaries or something or to areas where it's, it's not unseen, but it's kind of like hidden. Um, it also defies the idea of direction or hierarchy in a composition, uh, which I think is really interesting. So I like the disorientation of it. Um, I don't know, I, you know, you spend a lot of time with work and sometimes I think in the studio space when I'm going through this, I might be weaving narratives back and forth through the work that may be there apparent or not there um, so much for the viewer. Um, and I sometimes think the, 
the activity of that hopefully gives the work an underlying sort of resonance or kind of energy, I guess. Um, but boundaries are never fixed, you know? And so, I, and this fully falls into the whole postmodern notion of like no fixed boundaries or nonlinear sort of approaches to stuff. And um, I mean, that was always a real big interest of mine as well. It's like thinking about work critically and conceptually. Um, this is one of the things I think a lot about in terms of uh, working with a medium of clay per se. Um, I know a lot of clay artists, and I, in fact, I just did a workshop with a really good friend of mine, Chandra Abuse, who is a great decorative um, painter on her ceramic vessels, but she always is very dismissive, like, I don't want to talk about this stuff, it's too intellectual, your approach to this is just, you know, this is just about making pretty stuff, and in a certain way, that's what it is, but um, I always think that people should really think about the impulse, like, why we're making certain things the way we are, because clay utilitarian objects aren't necessary, right? I mean, we don't need them. Um, you can make or manufacture or buy something at Kmart or, um, or Kmart Target. That's that's really tasty right there. <laughs> Sorry about that. Now, now you know that probably in the final decades of my life. The, um, this is, you know, when you have cultural references that your students don't even get, that's when you know it's time to get out. Kmart is very popular in New Zealand, actually. So. <laughs> You're just, you're just, just, you're just very worldly. Yeah. Yeah. At any rate, um, I just think it's really important to think about why we're doing things and where these kind of pieces sort of fit in sort of some kind of continuity. Um, but I was thinking about borders further. I went over into the other, um, the gallery and, you know, I was just thinking about like Joyce Kozlov's work who has this really nice piece. She goes, is this art or not a high art or low art, which it's pretty funny title for a piece. And, you know, when you look at that repeated pattern, that's obviously on a grid um, that obviously has a certain structure. I think when you first look at it, you think, well, all of the shapes are very similar and there's a sort of continuity to them. Then you look further and you realize that really that's not what it's about. There's a, a kind of a, there's no center. There's no edges. There's no direction. Um, the colors are random, the way she colors in some of those objects. Um, I mean, there was a relationship, of course, in her palette, but, you know, it's a purposeful, like, approach, right, to take out that sort of sense of hierarchy and um, to put in, you know, the idea that there's no center, I guess. So I have three questions that kind of follow up with that entire last answer, but um, no, it's okay. Uh, so I want to rewind to the first part of what you were talking about when we were talking about borders. Um, and I want to touch on kind of the seen elements rather than the unseen elements in your work. So you're a Florida native. That's um, true. Yeah. And the use of native Florida plants in your work is strategic. Do you feel that your work, while also keeping in mind the interplay of seen and unseen, is also promoting a dialogue of environmental conservation? To a certain extent, I think it is. I, I think people may look at the flowers and go, well, I mean, they're stylized. I mean, they don't seem very specific in certain ways. Um, and I think when I started using floral decoration, I was thinking about the whole tradition of floral decoration. I mean, Isnik pottery, the influence of um, Japanese work, it's of course had on every ceramicist and all of the other sort of decorative sort of patterning. Um, but the specific specific nature of the flowers became more important. You know, partially the work is, any piece that you make is kind of a, a little bit of the story of you, right? The, the maker. Um, I mean, it's not that exciting of a story, but it's sort of um, in there. And, and so I needed to place it in a very specific place. And I think that, um, the golden asters, for instance, are endemic to this area. They're specifically grounded in this spot. They're not just found all over Florida or sort of in any generalized way. Um, the coreopsis or the state flower, you know, the swamp, um, the uh, marsh pinks that are in that big tile piece grow in wetlands with 
coreopsis in the spring. So I felt like it was really necessary to be kind of more specific about those images, I guess. So when we're talking about, um, I mean, the whole exhibition season right now is kind of on pattern and decoration, which you fall completely into uh, for me. And, and uh, you came of age during a time um, that gave rise to what was once considered counterculture. As you said, you were a hippie kid. Um, how do you seek to ampl amplify the significance of decorative arts in your work, aligning it with the ethos of the feminist movement? Well, I, I think for the feminist movement, especially in the 1970s, that was sort of like first wave of feminism. Um, many of those artists were trying to uh, re um, sort of discover so-called feminine arts. And um, I think that women were making things like weaving, embroidery, quilt making, um, pottery decoration. I mean, all of those were sort of, uh, you know, something to kind of like pick up and sort of celebrate um, as a way of sort of uh, deconstructing um, those kind of motifs. So, but the thing about ceramics, if you're in a fine arts uh, program, it's not so much now the case, but um, in the past, there's a hierarchy of making of mediums. Um, when you go into a, a BFA program, you know, at the top of the mountain are the painters, you know, they're always up there and, um, and everybody sort of stomps around. They, you know, I always think about my friend. I, I had a, a friend who used to paint, he'd smoke a cigarette and he always had a paintbrush in his hand. He'd smoke and he'd paint and he'd stand back and look and, you know, and then, you know, of course you go into the pottery studio and we were all running around. We have to make or clay, make or glaze, like set all this stuff up. And it was all this physical kind of labor. Um, you know, the painters could just be the intellects, right? They just sat there. It was all about the mind body duality, basically. You know, they were of the mind, we were of the body. We were the blue collar people. They were the, you know, they were like the executives, I guess. Um, what does that mean? Like, why would I purposely cho choose that? I, I mean, I think I always took the other path, right? I just, you know, I didn't want to be a business major. Um, in the 1970s, you know, my parents had some expectations. I mean, it sounds archaic and sort of semi for it, but, um, you know, you would go to college, you would get married, you know, you would have this life that would include children and I don't know, working at the junior league and puttering around at the country club or something. I don't know. But um, there was something about that whole life that was really awful. And the other part of that was um, that was the age that all of my friends' mothers, they started getting divorces. And, you know, women that did all that country club junior league crap ended up with no credit rating, no jobs, no like economic power. Um, so I guess this is a roundabout way. I, yeah, I sort of embraced it. I Once I learned about feminism, I was like pretty hardcore about it. Um, then I was really interested in second wave and then third wave. And I actually really love the way feminists critical theory looked at the way of making and sort of the way we digest information and um, the way certain things were unseen and, you know, how that played into what I did, I, I sort of embraced it. Pottery making is the domestic sphere. It stays within the home. It's like this place of, it's a small contained thing that we don't really need that can alter your sense of reality to a certain extent. Um, they can be beautiful objects. And I think beauty can be super subversive um, because beauty has the ability to disrupt your sort of thinking pattern a little bit. It's take your breath away. You can start thinking about things in a little bit different way. And I think that beautiful objects in the house have that ability too. You know, you go into a cup of coffee a little bit different than drinking something out of a styrofoam cup or something that's like the diner mug. I mean, you, it disrupts you. And um, so that also was a big appeal as well. Is that, that idea that it could be 
subversive and disruptive in a non-threatening way, you know, in a very sneaky way, I guess. It's kind of sneaky. I love that. <laughs> I do love it. I do love it. Um, so your work, and we've mentioned this, uh, at least Christine did in her introduction, we've talked about this. Uh, your work is influenced by Robert Kushner. He's one of your huge influences. Can you delve into the specific aspects of his work that resonate with you? Well, just about everything. I mean, <laughs> I love Kushner's work. I mean, I mean, this is what I like about Kushner. His work, he uses botanical forms, but also geometry. He uses layering, but the images remain flat. I mean, there's all these contradictions in it. Um, I love his brush, his marks. I mean, his mark making is really incredible. I love the fact that he collages on other information. I love the fact that his influences were from the same influence as mine were. He loves his McCartery. I have some examples there. He was really influenced by Japanese woodblock prints. He wasn't, um, he was kind of a globalist in a certain sense. I mean, Kushner did all sorts of stuff. He made costumes, he did performance. He was like kind of all over the place. The thing about pattern and decoration, which is really interesting to me is all of these guys, all of the women and men that were in that movement, um, you know, they took up a sort of a motif in a time where the worst thing you could say about a painting was that it was decorative. Like that was the worst. It was like saying, you're like the worst ever. You're made a decorative painting, sneer, yuck, blah. You know, and these guys were not, um, they sort of like took it on. They're like, yeah, is this high art or low art? What do you think it is? Like I'm in your face. The, the work is like very formal. It's as formal as any of the minimalist work that came up in the 60s. It's just as thought out. It's just as an intellectual of approach. But once again, you know, it's subversively beautiful, I guess. I don't know. I think in the 80s when they were coming up, you know, times were pretty bad. I mean, we had the nuclear countdown. I'm sorry if this offends anybody. Ronald Reagan, one of the everybody thinks it was a great president. I don't know. I feel like he's the origins of all the crap we're in now. Um, you know, we were coming out of the 60s Vietnam War. I mean, I, everybody I went to school with had what had a draft number, you know. We went to school, we didn't have any expectations that we were going to make it till, you know, most of my friends, they're not going to make it through their 20s. I mean, there just was no future. Um, and I think in spite of all of that sort of horror, Nixon and all the other crap, um, you know, these guys were making these beautiful, lush, incredible pieces. You know, why? I mean, because we sort of needed a sense of optimism, I guess. And, you know, probably that's where I'm gravitating towards now. I mean, we're in kind of bad times. And I think that people need to look and see some sense of optimism. So it's my sales job. <laughs> Life is gonna be okay. Yeah. I mean, you're pretty good at it, so that's good. Um, so I'm gonna go off script here a little bit. Um, so something we talk about when we're doing tours here and the docent team talks about is um, your influence with uh, Japanese culture and Japanese ceramics. Can you talk about that a little bit for us? I know the text uh, we covered kind of how you personify wabi-sabi in your, in your work. So can you talk a little bit about your trip over there? I know you took a group of students. I took a group of students. Okay, I'm going to say this. My husband came with me, which he's also a really great ceramicist as well. And uh, you can always remember everything in stories. It sort of frames your narrative. Uh, we went into, uh, we got there early. We were in Tokyo. We went into the Museum of Fine Arts in Tokyo. And I remember walking into the museum and there was this huge group of people standing around a vitrine, you know, and um, inside of it was this little simple tea bowl. And for Westerners, the tea bowl is kind of like ugly, you know, it's sort of simple, it's just a bowl. Um, but you know what was really kind of amazing is, you know, there's such a sense of sensitivity to like just the gestural quality of 
simple like flick of a lip or the way they turn the foot or you know just the hand the way it moved around the material all of that stuff is sort of frozen in space i just think that kind of asian sort of appreciation of the hand is really important. You know, when I was in Japan, you know, we had so many great experiences. My students got to work in studios. We were introduced to all these artists and got to go on these um, great visits in their home and have tea. Um, but really what amazed me about the place was uh, just the sense of hidden and revealing. So when there's a picture in this uh, travel log that I have going on behind me um, about the Inari shrine. And so that's right outside of Kyoto. It's where all the orange, um, you just go up a hill. So you go up a hill and you're walking through all of these gates and it's all wooded. I mean, it's so beautiful. And then you, and it would be so dark. And then you would walk into these areas where the trees just opened up and then all the shrines were there. So there were all these little and Nari is the fox. So there's all these little fox statues um, and cats. And then the trees would close back in again and you continue on the, the journey. And it, it was just that idea of like opening and closing. Everything's not on the surface so much. Um, there's a lot of things behind it. It's just, it was just pretty much a revelation. Another revelation. We were in the Raku Museum in Kyoto and we're walking through this beautiful garden entryway into the museum. It's, it's gorgeous, there's flowers. You're looking at, there's like little pieces, you know, like little dew on the flowers. I mean, the aesthetics of it were so incredible. And Wabi Sabi, it sounds like it's something that's just by chance, but it is absolutely not by chance. So we're in the museum looking around and um, I was coming back to the uh, front of it and looking through the window to the outside just to sort of admire the garden. And I realized there was a woman from the museum and she was out there with a spray bottle spraying the flowers. And you know, what was so cool about that was, it was like, you would think it was natural, but it wasn't. It was natural, but artificial. It was staged. It was, there was something about it that um, made you realize that you could approach things in an artful way all the time, always thinking about, the impression of what you would see, how it would affect you as you walk through the space, the chance encounter of something that seems like, once again, like breaking you out of your normal way of thinking. It was just kind of extraordinary. I mean, the energy of that, I mean, the, just the aspect of somebody being so aware and mindful of um, the dew on a flower. I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. I don't know. There, there is a significant cultural difference, I would say, between the way that Japanese people look at artists and view artists than how Americans do. Um, they're revered, you know, it's it's a bit different. Well, yeah, maybe, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, here we got, I guess the revered, I don't know what's revered anymore. I, I think Western, I, like Western culture is different. I mean, if you could talk about European culture, it's different than American culture, right. American culture. I mean, we only, right now we only celebrate the stupid. I mean, that's pretty much, I mean, I think so. I, I mean, I'm sorry, but it seems like a celebration of the stupid, but whatever. What I most appreciate about you is that you will always be honest with me and tell me like it is. So. <laughs> I'm sorry, once again, if I no, no, here. no. Um, so can you describe the emotional and creative challenges involved in the firing process, particularly with the anticipation and uncertainty it brings? Okay, here's the deal about firing. If you fire too fast, you can blow the stuff up. <laughs> if you cool it too fast, you'll blow it up. If you make the glaze wrong, it's gonna make, be all screwed up. Um, my, I have a couple of my firing buddies here. They know that a lot of people are more sort of more accepting, I guess would be a way of putting it. My husband's very accepting. He like rolls with it. It's all gonna be fine. Me, I have a heightened sense of anxiety. 
Um, especially with the wood kiln, if the flame or the wood ash hits my decoration and obliterates it. I mean, I used to have this joke with Mark, you know, when we would load our pieces. Just remember, it's an hour per flower. If you screw it up, it's not divorce, but, you know, you know, it's going to be a challenge. And then, um, and so you would brick up the door, you'd fire the kiln, it would take a week for it to cool. And then we would unbrick the door. I have one other friend in here that's as anxious about the firing as I am. And I will say it's Mr. Smith. Um, Mr. Smith would call me up. What's it look like? What's it look like? I'd start unbreaking the door, shining my flashlight in there. I was like, oh my God, it's a disaster. In fact, I would be so distraught that Mark would come in and I'd say, I can't even unbrick the door anymore. Everything looks like crap. <laughs> it's a terrible disaster. Then Mr. Smith would basically reinforce my like <laughs> pessimism and you know abjectness or whatever and mark would be and jonathan would be in the background going it's gonna be fine like you know pollyanna and all the way out which was always somewhat irritating i guess to a certain extent but at any rate i guess the thing about it is with the firing it's a good thing for me because i have a lot of control over my surface and the forms that i make and I have to be able to allow certain aspects of it to, to let go. Like I can't be narrating the entire outcome. That would be super boring. So when you open up the kiln, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's horrid, and sometimes you just have to kind of come to grips with it, you know, I guess. So why do I do it? I don't know, because I'm a masochist, I don't know. <laughs> maybe <laughs> always honest um the text men mentions your upcoming uh revolution and rebirth into the next chapter how do you envision this new season of your artistic journey drawing parallels with the wildflowers that have influenced you well that was the hardest question i think so far um at least i told you in advance what i was going to ask yeah you. that was a hard one yeah, so i think about the title of the big piece on um being becoming and decaying which of course is an allusion to just the life cycle and of course am i in the decaying part probably yes no, at this point absolutely. at any rate but the becoming i i don't know i'm never gonna not uh use the theme of boundaries and borders or the liminal space i mean to me that's like endlessly fascinating and I remember talking, I've talked to my students over the years, and they always have these initially beginning students, they have this, I have to come up with this big idea, this big narrative, it has to be serious, it has to be all these things, it really does not have to be any of those things, it needs to be something that can be interesting to you for a really long time, it needs to have, it needs to be a subject that has different pathways that you can sort of meander through. Um, it just needs to be something that's open enough that you can actually just enter into this other place. So for, you know, my life as a teacher um, and also as a mom of kids that are now grown, when I was working in the studio, I was always in little snippets of like time. And I think what I'm really looking forward to is being able to sit down and actually have time to actually be considerate of the work and the process. I think, you know, the opportunity to come into the museum to be able to build pieces that I normally wouldn't do. I mean, I normally wouldn't put together big tile projects. I mean, what, I mean, God knows I only have so many walls, so much wall space in my house. Um, I mean, that's a pretty interesting thing because there's stuff that you don't really expect to happen. Like I think about that one piece, you know, when you look at on the side, the contours of the tiles change, they become figurative and serpentine, almost like my baskets, which I thought that was kind of a remarkable thing to sort of find out about. Or, you know, I think about the other tile pieces, I actually blow them up with my breath, you know, and so there's a sort of softness to them. And, um, so I think I'll be doing a lot more work like that, just thinking about the surface. I like making coffee cups still. Um, I think actually doing functional work is really difficult to do it well. Um, 
I don't really think about a poppy cup like, you know, oh, that's a good handle and that's a good lip as little parts like that. I think about it as a sort of weird activity that's not necessary. Um, I don't know, I feel also right now a kind of um, anxiety about the passage of time because I'm older and the physicality of the work is actually really difficult. And so I feel like I'm kind of running out of time to a certain extent. Um, I don't know. I wish I knew as much now. I mean, back when I was young as I do now about stuff. Don't we all? Yeah, kind of. I don't know. I, I don't know where it's going, really. I'm excited about it, though. It's good. Yeah, it's good. So at the risk of um, listening to myself talk all night, uh, does anybody want to ask a question? God, please ask a question. We have one here, yeah. I'm going to give you the one. So writers write every day. So when you get up in the morning, do you draw what you're feeling or thinking? I draw almost every single day. Um, I believe it's really important to go into my studio every day. Even if I don't do anything, I'll go in there and maybe read the newspaper or, I don't know, read a book or something. Um, I think, I mean, writers write every day because the more you write, the better you get. Um, the more you write, the more you can write. The more you make, the more you can make. Um, I like the discipline of it. I think I've been pretty disciplined over the years uh, working because I always knew I had four days a week in the, the school and I had one day a week I could work in the studio and I was actually very religious about that. Every Friday I was in there doing my work. And, um, you know, I feel like that kind of sense of discipline is gonna be helpful. Um, yeah, I go in and draw, I draw a lot. I. I mean, I don't have sketchbooks. I was just thinking about this, how much I draw, you know? Um, I think my painting professor from long ago would be happy because actually that's pretty much what I'm doing still, you know? <clears throat> so yeah, my drawing's getting better too. I think it gets better a little bit, you know, it's getting better. Speaking about your um, interest in borders, lack of it, or lack of them, have you um, ever in your work tried to relate what you do to language as well? Because if we're looking at the English language, for example, um, if we're talking about um, children go to school, there's no, there's no, there's no exact sense. You know, we may call it present, but you cannot tell when it starts or ends. Or if you say people are in the room, we have no idea how many, there was no sense of hope. Some languages do make those borders very, very clear. English does not in that way. Or where English may have a, a very, very clear sense of tense of time. And um, Japanese, for example, does not. You know, you have to indicate time with a separate meaningful unit. Um, has any of that come into some of your work? Well, I read a lot. And um, actually there's a, a lot of reading that has a huge effect on the way I work. So uh, one author that's had a, an incredible um, influence on my work is Jorge Boris, um, the Argentinian um, writer. and. Um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is he talks a lot about this. Like he has a story about a disc that only has one face. And so when you turn it over, it disappears. That's how they lose this little coin. It flips over on the table, I mean, on the floor and it's gone. Or the idea that he, um, you know, this is a sort of a bad rendition of the story. I mean, it's very short, but you know, he, talked about tigers dreaming of tigers and you know he talks about the dream of the tiger and how disappointed he is and his actual conjuring up in his mind because it can never actually match 
all of his recollections of all of the fabulous like images of tigers he's seen in the past. I, I think that this is a lot about my work really. I, I feel, um, you know, I really like the fact that I make it not oriented somewhere, you know, or it feels like it's just floating away and sort of blowing out all over the place or, um, I mean, this is not really maybe a great answer to the question, but um, in terms of the way it works with that idea of borders or the liminal space or the lack thereof, um, I think that has a lot to do with it, you know? I mean, Clarice Lixbeter is another writer or poet that I really was influenced by. And I, I think what's really interesting is all of those writers were trying to write a present to be present, which is impossible. I mean, you you try to find yourself at a pinpointed in one place, but you, you're actually always looking back to it or forward towards it, but you're not, you can't describe yourself in it at that point. And um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's sort of what I think. Getting, getting there without a board. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. It's a very good question. Who else? And then, oh. Kim, thank you for um, being an artist, maintaining in America now, if we catalog more of an artist teaching these techniques. I can remember as a boy during those 70s and 80s, the earrings and the enamel and the techniques. And as a teacher, again, thank you for your commitment for 35 years, teaching those lost skills. One question, if students in universities will catalog more and more of American artists and just your beauty, um, we can teach our children that we'll be a great nation too, like Japan, because of our artists. So another question to try to get everybody to laugh, do you think your ceramics in your art could make it to the moon or Mars as a vessel? And if, discovered 500 years from now by Josh Gates or an archeologist, um, would you not be proud to be an American artist that somebody 500 years from now could identify your vessel? I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, and first of all, I hope it doesn't go to Mars because I think the whole trip to think to Mars is stupid, but whatever. <laughs> I don't know why people want to live there, but go for it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't really care if my work looks American or not American. I mean, you know, this is what I this is what I hope that people would see if they uncovered my work in five hundred years. I would like them to put their hand on a piece and find feel themselves touching the material where I touched it, and so there's a con immediate connection between the past and the present. You know, I really love to look at historic ceramic works or paintings or whatever. And I just imagine the person's hand in that material, you know, the fact that they were, it's just so incredible to me. You know, we talked a little bit about Botticelli's Primavera, the Allegory of Spring, which I mean, it's like calendar art. I understand people look at that and they're like, oh, well. I, I remember when I was 15, I walked into the Uffizi Gallery and um, I turned the corner and it was like a revelation. And you know, what's really kind of amazing about that painting is it was in obscurity for hundreds of years. Like they didn't even rediscover it in the Medici, the Medici like, I don't know, a state somewhere outside, you know, in Tuscany somewhere, it was sitting in a living room. No one even knew about it, you know, and then someone found it, you know, and they opened it up and they they looked at this painting and they're like, oh my God, you know, and 
What was Botticelli doing? He's a 15th century Renaissance artist. He knew about perspective. He said no to perspective. All the painting is like all flat right up on the surface. You know, we've lost the language to read the painting. There's like treatises written about the painting. What does this symbolize? What does that symbolize? But when he was making that painting, he was making it for a specific time, but he was also trying to communicate a certain idea. And I think that all artists, that's all they're trying to do is just like throw something out there. So people, it's like a letter in a bottle that you throw in the ocean. You just hope someone finds it and kind of sees it. Um, I don't know, that's what I think. I don't care if it's in the mirror, I don't care. Anybody else? I have a question if no one else does. You want to have a question? I, I just wanted to talk about your surfaces. It, it looks like a myolica process. Is that right? I mean, how do you develop your surface? It's it's not a myolica process. It's actually a printmaking process. Um, I actually start the drawings on uh, newsprint and um, with the black line and utilize it like a coloring book and then print the image on the clay. And then after it's printed, then I make the object. So um, the surface comes first, the object comes last, um, which is a kind of weird way of decorating ceramics, I think. Um, but it's not made of it. It's all under glaze and colored slips and, you know, some glazes basically. How, how do you, uh, can you explain your process a little on how you transfer uh, that image and actually print it on your surface? And I was actually curious about um, your tiles that are kind of the pillow shaped. And I guess you mentioned that you kind of use your own breath to inflate them a little. Can you explain those two processes? So I work the, with the clay really soft. Um, some people when they're doing, I, I mean, it's all slab construction. Okay, I'm sorry if this is going to bore everybody because this is all <laughs> waxing on about the technical aspects of clay. But you can approach uh, slab building either by using real hard, rigid slabs, letting them dry, building them like wood, or making them soft so they have more of an organic quality. So I like them soft. The images themselves, um, I'll draw them on the newsprint and let all of the imagery dry, and then I'll cover the the newsprint with opaque liquid clay, which is just, it's called slip. Um, and then I let that get tacky and I actually just flip that um, paper onto a flat slab of clay and then squeegee it out and peel the paper. Then I make the box. I mean, I've made the box like the walls in the back, but then I have to lay the, the image on top of the box and attach it. And while the and so the clay is so soft, the box actually deflates and I have to inflate it with air. So it holds up or it, you know, it doesn't just sort of collapse on me. And um, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, it's a it's sort of, once again, a masochistic and somewhat weirdly stupid thing to do. And I could just make Olica, which would be way easier. <laughs> just make the piece, biscuit, then do the decoration on top of it. Why would you do that? That would be so easy. Yeah, I know. I know. I had a friend of mine one time. He goes, my God, if you could make it more complicated, <laughs> you probably would. Oh, well. Well, thank you. That gave a, a, a good visual for that. And I think us printmaking nerds over here in the corner want to try it. So oh, okay. we'll, have to, we'll have to get to the, together and do that. Does anybody else have any questions? Oh, yes. Um, to build further on to the technical boring stuff. But actually, I've got a question about starting with the decoration as opposed to finishing. Does that, I assume you have some sort of a preconceived idea of what you're building before you start with the decoration, but does the decoration, in fact, affect where you're going with the piece, starting with the decoration? So you can see over there, I have a couple of sort of uh, signature forms, like the little bottles and the baskets, um, and also the tiles, obviously. Um, I work with templates, 
you know, I template everything because I want to make sure that I don't decorate wildly into space that doesn't get used because it's time consuming. Um, one of the things I really like doing about decorating prior to making is the fact that when I go into the clay, because it's soft, I can stretch it. And so the surface stretches. Um, it's interesting to me because then when it's fired, the process of making kind of, it's another layer of information that shows up in the surface itself. Um, they literally have stretch marks. Everybody can relate to that, I think. Um, you know, yet another you know, commentary on myself, I guess. But um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just like the idea of stretching things out. And yeah, so yeah, the question, the answer is yes, I do know what I'm doing uh, before. It's not just random. Um, it's pretty specific, which is another reason why I like the firing process to break the sort of control over that a little bit, you know, so it's just not dead, I guess. I don't know. Okay, Michelle. Well, in order to rest and fall, you know, push our craft, um, we're going to need a lot of your response. Uh, we have, we have the accidents that we share to help me push your craft, help me push your process. Can you repeat the question? Because it can't really. Um, the question basically was, are there any happy ass accidents that sort of help push my craft or um, because accidents occur a lot? I will say this. I sometimes get a wild hair and decide to make some crazy thing, you know, which is off. This is how I sort of push my forms a bit. It's like, I'll go, oh, okay. Almost everything I do with the surface I mix all these materials and I never do tests beforehand. Uh, this is something that drives my husband nuts. Um, I will just say, I think these two things will work and then I fire them and then hopefully they work. Now that is insane. Um, but the good news is, is what I found is that I've been able to utilize all these products, these commercial products in ways that are not actually the stated way you're supposed to use them, I guess. So um, I was working with a bunch of um, people over this past weekend teaching a, a surface workshop. And I'm like, you know, you can take underglaze and glaze and cut, you know, clay slip and mix it all together, just like paint. You just apply it like paint. And they're like, well, no, you can't because you got to put glaze on top of this. And, you know, no, you don't. You just have to do it this way. And then, you know, the other thing is that gives me an endless sort of palette to mix my colors from. So that's one happy accident I sort of found out about. Um, I think sometimes the mistakes in my work are actually good. Nothing teaches like failure, you know, and so that'll teach you what not to do, which is a good thing. Um, if you get too excessive, it'll teach you not to be so ex excessive. Um, so I actually like the mess ups quite a bit. I usually always keep them and I keep them in my studio so I can look at them, um, if that makes sense. So I don't really see them as bad things. They're just, they're actually fortunate. It's fortunate to have screw ups. Michelle. Well, the can keep here, yeah. yeah. So we're just... With reference to your decoration, your imagery, um, what is what are you thinking about with the circles, the globe, the globe-like images that enhance the work or are part of the design, the full design? We referring to the drawings there where you saw like the compass drawings. So uh, the, on the the circles. The circles and... Oh, the little circles that float. Those circles that float um, have direct references to textile design, but they also have a sort of reference to uh, John Baldessari's work, who had those little bendy dots that floated across the images of his photos. Uh, the thing I thought was really interesting about the way those circles work is it's another level of information that sort of breaks the narrative or breaks the pictorial plane, I guess. But in the sense of um, some of maybe 
it, it, it's not an, it doesn't create space, you know, it just creates another reality that doesn't seem to match with what's going on behind it, I guess. And um, I like to weave those uh, little circles back and forth. So sometimes you'll see the botanical forms going in front of them, or sometimes they go behind. Sometimes they do both of those things in one image. Um, I usually set the circles up first before I actually do all the drawings. You know, those go first down. Um, and it's almost like another way of setting up a grid or a, a sort of a um, an underlying structure that holds everything together. Uh, one of the things I, I always worry about with some of these um, sort of tumbling sort of compositions um, that they will have no structure to hold together. So they'll sort of fall apart um, visually. Um, so I think it's really important that there has to be something there, like some kind of structure. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. They're kind of weird, right? I mean, a little. They're, they're not weird, but they're um, curious. They're curious, yeah. It's just another... I really love the way those bendy dots would float across people's faces or like, it's just... You know, it was, it was like you're reading the image, like you're trying to trying to get the story out of it. There's a narrative behind it. You know, it's like recognizable imagery, um, which is kind of the subject, right, you're looking at. But the content doesn't have anything to do with the subject, which is the one thing that people don't realize. You know, the subject of some of these paintings has nothing to do with the content the artist means. Um, people try to read them like they're reading a story, but that's actually not what they are. Um, I mean, to go back to that language question, you know, visual arts is a language, but it's not a language in the sense of a linear kind of language. It's a, it's a sort of a ambiguous language. Um, I was talking to a psych the person I was working with this weekend, she's a, she was formerly a psychologist and she goes, you know, you're not really neurotypical the way you like talk about stuff. And um, I never really heard that before and I thought, been thinking about that a lot actually you know I always make jokes I'm sort of abstract random so I sort of grab things and sort of put them in a space but sometimes I don't really organize them in a, a way that seems easy to describe I guess and um then I think well you know whatever <laughs> I mean that's kind of the way people make it I mean, I don't think any artist goes into their work thinking that this is the story, this is what I'm gonna do, this is how I'm gonna do it, and this is what it means. I mean, I don't really think anybody does that. I mean, you know, do you? Maybe, I don't know if so. There are no more questions. I just wanna say thank you, Ken. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm like sad this is over. <laughs> So, I like to talk. <laughs> and I like to talk to you. So um, everyone, I want to give you an opportunity to make sure you can have at least an informal dialogue with Kim. So please stay a while, have a cookie, have a beverage, chat with us. We're happy to have you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Why is it you start